Diana Falzo, and this is 4 for 4 Science. Four epic science topics crammed into four adrenaline-filled minutes. Buckle up. This is not your kid's rendering of a magical unicorn. A Siberian unicorn existed, and much more recently than we once believed. James, when did unicorns roam the earth? Finally, the unicorn story we've all been waiting for, except it wasn't really a unicorn. I'm sorry to disappoint you. It was a Siberian rhino. Now, it's really interesting because these were thought to be extinct 350,000 years ago, but new research that's been basically discovered a fossilized skull fragment in Kazakhstan suggests that they were around up until 29,000 years ago. Wow. So the whole thing here is they could have been around at the same time as humans. Oh. I don't know. I think that's really cool. Great. They lived a few hundred thousand <laughs> years longer, but that doesn't prove that unicorns are based off of that creature because unicorns didn't really take hold until the Middle Ages. So I think people shouldn't be quick to, to think that. Hmm. Yeah, and this, this doesn't quite look like what you'd think of as a unicorn. Again, it was a rhino. It may have been covered in fur. Actually, last year, scientists discovered the mummy of a baby woolly rhino in that same area. So, you know, we could be thinking of something much puffier. You're all non-believers, and it breaks my heart. <laughs> this is mythological in its own way. A Siberian rhino still likened to a unicorn. I don't know, I believe. Bison, like many non-millennials, are not fans of selfies, or at least that's one theory as to why there are more injuries at Yellowstone. Sarah, what's going on? Interesting report out from the CDC. So last summer, there were five people who were injured by bison. Uh, normally, this number is around two two a summer. Three of these people were injured when taking photos. One person did admit to taking a selfie. The other two, they didn't say selfie, but they said that their backs were turns away, turned away from the bison while they took the picture, which mm. sounds like a selfie to me. Yes, it does. Where are we going with this whole selfie thing? I mean, have <laughs> we had enough warnings? I think like at Yellowstone, aren't you supposed to stay 75 feet away from the bison? Is that the guideline? Why would you want to get so close to them? Like, we know that like these things are dangerous. And just the whole selfie thing is killing Because common sense continues to elude people. Yeah. Yeah, I think the key here is to practice safe selfie taking. <laughs> um, I, like, we have to remember, like, yes, we're at Yellowstone, and it's a cool place, and we want to say that we've been there. But these are wild animals, and I think that it's really important to respect that. It is important. And when you're at any national park, you shouldn't be an adventurer and think about getting likes on your social media. A man recently had a wind gust that took his child away while taking a selfie. So think, people. Think. A wearable patch uses sweat to monitor glucose levels, replacing needles in the future, which is giving a lot of hope to diabetics everywhere. Claire, tell us about this new development. Yeah, so this is really cool. It's made of a flexible graphene material, and so basically the person puts it on, and uh, sensors within the patch detect changes in your sweat, like your pH changes or temperature rises, and that signals a high blood glucose level. Once that happens, then heat within the patch then breaks down these little like coverings over micro needles. The micro needles release material that then lowers your uh, releases uh, medicine that lowers your blood glucose. So it's really cool and a really good idea yeah. for diabetes. It's an all awesome thing. I mean, but we're at the early stages of it. I think there's still some question marks about how it's gonna how it's gonna play out. I mean, how large will a patch have to be? Mm -hmm. um, kind of how is it gonna cope with strenuous exercise? How is it gonna cope with twenty four hour monitoring? These are all questions that have been asked, but it's an awesome, awesome technology mm -hmm. potentially. Yeah, this non-invasive way to measure blood glucose, it's kind of a holy grail in medicine. Now, this isn't the first device that's been developed. The first one was approved by the FDA about 15 years ago, but it wasn't very user-friendly, and it didn't catch on. No matter if you speak English, French, or Mandarin, the not face is universal. James, what have researchers found? And can we try a not face? Mm, Karen, so we're talking <laughs> about a furrowed brow, raised chin, and tight lips. Like, hmm. I'll do that without laughing. But yeah, <laughs> researchers at Ohio State University basically have found that there's this universal not face. And, you know, it's, they've studied 150 different people, kind of speakers of English, Spanish, Mandarin, also, interestingly, American Sign Language people. Huh. And so and basically this is, this is a common theme throughout kind of expressing negative sentiments. And it occurs at the same frequency as language and as basically sign language as well. I think it's really cool that like we tend to think as language as sort of like overtaking emotion or like 
emotions, but it just shows that language is really intertwined with emotions and sometimes will, um, a really strong uh, facial expression can be more powerful than a spoken word. Yeah, and what's cool about this study is that the researchers are now trying to develop an algorithm that would be able to go through 10,000 hours of YouTube videos and see if they can pick out any other basic universal facial expressions. Well, that totally makes sense because emotions are universal. So mm -hmm. why wouldn't our facial expressions match that? Now, you know what we think. Tell us what you think using the hashtag 444science. Let's give them the not face.